this morning, my topic is this, or my title, is do you ever feel stuck? If your answer is yes to that, wouldn't you just raise your hand that I know I'm speaking to the right group of people, okay, good. Next week, we're starting a series through the book of Philippians called A Rebel's Guide to Joy. And this Sunday, knowing it was our Alpha Sunday that we invited all our Alpha guests, I thought I would tackle Act 16, which is the intro, actually, it's, it's how the church in, in Philippi was started. The book of Philippians was written back to this church at Philippi. So I'd like to read from Act 16, verse 22 through to 26. If you've got a Bible, you might like to turn there. If you don't, the verses should appear on the screen behind me. So it says this, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer, I want you to remember this man because he appears later in the story, this jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. I don't know why they thought Paul and Silas were such a huge flight risk being preachers as they were, but that was the order he received. And he said, when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Now, to give a bit of background to this snippet that I've just read, Paul and his buddy Silas were on a, a trip, busy preaching the gospel and planting churches, and up till now, had only done that in the province of Asia. Uh, he was to, Paul was together with Silas. As their team grew, they added a guy named Timothy onto it, Luke, he was the author of the book of Luke and the, Gos uh, the gospel of Luke and this book of Acts. He was with them at this point. And uh, Luke writes about these events that happened. He was right there. He was an eyewitness of what happened. While they were still on the European side, uh, sorry, on the Asian side, Paul was trying to figure out, God, where do you want us to go next? And they thought they would head in one direction and God very clearly told them no. And they tried to head in another direction and that door was also kind of closed. And then Paul had a dream one night. And in his dream, he saw a man from the province of Macedonia, which was across the sea in the continent of Europe, actually what we know as Europe today. He, saw, he had a dream, and in his dream, there was a Macedonian man saying, please come and help us. So earlier on in the chapter, it says, Paul figured that God was calling them to go to Macedonia. The very first city that they arrive in is the city of Philippi. And they start off with the measure of success because on the first Sabbath day that they're there, they go and look for a place of prayer and they head outside the city gates next to the river where people gathered to pray and they, they start talking to people. And a lady there, a prominent lady, the Bible says she was a dealer in purple cloth, which uh, that might be like saying she ran the Porsche and Ferrari dealerships in the city of Philippi. She heard their message and her heart responded to them, and she said to them, okay, you bunch of guys that are traveling, you come and stay in my house, I think complex. And so they went to stay there. And for the next few weeks, they kept on speaking to people, and they, I'm guessing, felt like they'd found some traction in Philippi. And then things started to take a little bit of an interesting turn. One day, on their way to meet, this a slave girl started to shout after them, and the next day, she did the same thing, and she would follow them just shouting. And the Bible says that this slave girl actually was, she was able to fortune tell, predict some of the future. And that wasn't through any good means. In fact, it was through, by means of an evil spirit that had kind of kept her bound. And so just remember this idea of being bound, of being kind of held captive. So she was not only a slave on the outside, also on the inside. And because she was used as a fortune teller, the Bible says her owners had made a lot of money out of her. And after this had gone on for a little while, Paul got frustrated and uh, 
he turned to her one day and spoke to this evil spirit that had kept about and said, get out. And this girl was immediately set free on the inside. So now that was great news for the slave girl, but terrible news for her owners. They'd lost their means of making money. But this wasn't really a good reason for starting a riot in the city. So they decided they were going to pin it on Paul and Silas's nationality. So they went to the, into the marketplace and said, because these guys are Jews, they've come here, they're teaching different customs to us. We want nothing to do. There was this whole uproar and they got pulled in front of the magistrates. We then picked up the verse that we read that said the magistrates ordered them to be stripped. In other words, their clothes to be ripped off them ordered them to be beaten with rods. Can you imagine how painful that must have been? Paul and Silas stretched out and then beaten with rods. After that, it says they were then flogged. It seems like it was a separate whipping, beaten with whips. And then they were thrown in jail. So now, I asked the question up front, have you ever felt stuck? And sometimes feeling stuck involves feeling stripped, where you feel like I've just been left naked, I, 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 I've been stripped of something. And for some people here, it, your, your story might be that I've been stripped of health, or I've been stripped of a business idea, or I've been stripped financially. My reputation has been stripped. There might be relationships that were going well, and you've been stripped of those relationships. And so you identify with this idea of being stripped and you might not have been beaten with rods and flogged literally, but it might have been with words or with circumstances or with some form of pain. So what's, what's really interesting here is that Paul and Silas were doing a good thing by their interaction with the slave girl. That was a really good thing. Her life was changed for the better and the good thing that they did ended up with the bad thing, them getting beaten and thrown in jail. Now, for many of us, that story is true at various points. We think, well, we're doing some good things. They are good. And then a bad thing comes out of that. What is our response when we get stuck in those kinds of situations where we're trying to do good, and then a bad thing happens and something goes wrong, something gets twisted, something gets thrown at us, we feel stripped in some way. And Paul and Silas, the net result of their doing a good thing, ends them up that night badly beaten, and badly flogged in jail. And this idea of being stuck in a jail cell is quite an interesting one because within themselves, they were powerless to escape. Not only were they in the inner cell, but their feet were fastened in stocks. You know what stocks are? Those wooden goodies that they get locked down, just got a hole, in this case, for their two feet. So they're sitting on the floor, their feet in stocks, and they are absolutely stuck. There might be some people here that recently you've started a new relationship with God. And you think, well, this is, it's obviously a good thing. We had our Alpha Day here yesterday. And on the Alpha Day, for those that have never done Alpha, we, we cover two sessions. One about who is the Holy Spirit and what does He do? And then the second session of how can I be filled with the Spirit? And at the end, we invited people to come forward for a time of prayer. And there was an amazing response of people coming. And I just heard some of the stories I can only imagine what else God was busy doing among, uh, with different people, but I could see people crying tears. I, it looked like people were feeling themselves being set free. I know I spoke to some people who told me of others who had started a new relationship with God, and yesterday was the day. Our kids' churches, I love it when I hear those guys jumping. I know I've got a son up there, and he's pumping, and uh, so we say, well, I've started a good thing. Obviously a good thing to get my life right with God and connect with Him. And these kinds of verses help us understand that when we start a good thing, it doesn't always look like the rose petals from there forward. Sometimes you also get the rose thorns. So Paul and Silas are out there making something happen, doing something good, and when they suddenly get beaten with rods, whipped, and thrown in the inner cell. Now, I heard someone preaching on this last year, July, and, and he said one or two things that just stuck with me. And this was one of the things that he said. He said, if you don't mind putting up that, that next verse about uh, 16, 20, 24. So it says, the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. 
And, and the next verse, verse 24, tells us of what he did to guard them carefully. And he did one thing right, and he did one thing wrong. The one thing that he did right was to make sure that they would stay there, but he did something wrong, which ended up with them getting out. And the thing that he did right was this, is he, he put their feet in stocks. So there they are, feet locked down. Back beaten, bleeding, they bruised. And they are stuck. Have you ever felt stuck? Paul and Silas are stuck. But did you see the one thing that he did wrong in that verse? If you read it again carefully, it says, he put them in the inner cell, singular. If he really wanted to keep them stuck, he should have put them in cells, plural. And the mistake this jailer made was to put them both in the same cell. And I'd like to speak, I've got three comments to make or three points if you're taking notes today is first of all, the power in being with faith-filled people. I'd like to speak about three sources of power we get to get through these times when we feel stuck. There's a great power in being with faithful people. See, one of the best weapons that the devil would use against any person who wants to grow in their faith is the weapon of isolation. And if you were to look back on your life, and I look back on mine, very often the times when we have been at our most discouraged and been at our most stuck, it's when we've been isolated, when we've allowed ourselves to get isolated. Very often what happens is that even though there's people around us, people extending a hand of love or friendship, or whatever, we grow isolated in ourselves. You see, the devil doesn't need to get us to become commit massive crimes that will get us thrown in a physical jail, if he can just get us to think you are isolated. He's moved us a whole, a whole lot um, away from what God wants us to do. If he can just get us to think on a Sunday morning, you know what? I've had a bad week. I've had a tough time. I just need a day's rest. I'm gonna keep away from the people of God. I'm gonna keep away from hanging out and keep away from hearing his word. Well, you know, that's not a sin. Of course it isn't. But it can create a feeling of isolation that the next week, Sunday morning, I wake up, I think, well, you know, nobody really missed me. And so I'm just gonna stay away this, this next week and then the next week I'm away for something else. And by the fourth week, I think, well, gee, I haven't been to church now for a month. Well, you know, it probably won't feel that bad to take another week off. And if you're part of a life group, what a great source of encouragement. And I miss one week and well, stuff happens, miss a second week, miss a third week, and then I start to feel isolated. If I can just, the devil can just get me feeling a little bit isolated, I get more and more stuck. Maybe that's why Hebrews 10 verse 24 and 25 says this, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, capital day, approaching. I guess the writer of Hebrews knew that he'd be writing to people like us because the people back in that day had a similar problem. He says, now don't give up the habit. This is a good habit. You get bad habits, you get good habits. This is a great habit. He says, don't give up the habit of meeting together. Don't give up the habit of getting around people who are full of faith. We come together and you, I mean, I just think of the songs that we've sung. We arrive and our minds are all over, disconnected. Every one of us got different stories. And then we start to sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, and I didn't intend to get that, but I'm here now. Look full in his wonderful face. Then afterwards on the way out, people are just high-fiving and I grab a cup of coffee and I'm just chatting. And I get home and my whole mindset is different to actually how I woke up and started the day. And that's what this verse is saying. We we encourage one another. What does it mean to encourage? It means to fill with courage. 
So it says, consider how we may spur one another on. That, I don't know how you interpret the word spur. I mean it a good kick in the side with the boots. Consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Do not give up meeting as someone the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Let us fill each other with courage. You're doing well. Let's go for it. That's great. Can I pray for you? Can I help you? And all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching the day that Jesus Christ will return. I heard of an experiment that was done on monkeys, and I just heard about it. I didn't do the experiment. But what they did with these monkeys is that they, they gave them, they were measuring the cortisol levels in their blood. And they took these monkeys and kept them in separate cages, isolated, and then would shock them with lights and with loud noises and give them fright. And then they would measure after a certain period of time the amount of cortisol in their bloodstream. In other words, the amount of stress that those monkeys were under. And how's this for interesting? They did the experiment with monkeys in isolated cages, and then they did them with monkeys together in a cage, two monkeys per cage. The same amount of fright. They didn't change the experiment, but the levels of cortisol in the monkey's bloodstream was half when they were together than when they were isolated. Because there's power in being with others that are, if you like, in the same boat. In our case, in trying to do faith and live life and move forward. So I'd like to ask you, what kind of people are you stuck with? Because it makes a massive difference. What kind of people are we surrounding ourselves with? Hopefully it's all kinds. But the very close people, the people that we're kind of stuck in the in the jail cell and in the situations, people that are talking to us through those times, are they people who are full of faith? People who are filling us with courage? Or have we allowed ourselves to get into cycles of cynicism and discouragement and disillusionment? Uh, cycles of negativity. I truly believe that if we're gonna be um, people that move forward, we need to work so hard to develop on the inside and in our conversation and with people around us, if I could call it a high five culture. It's not that difficult actually to see when things are wrong. It doesn't take a whole lot. Listen to a preacher a few years ago who said, it doesn't take much to be critical to see the problem. It actually just requires a single eye and one brain cell. It doesn't take a lot to murmur and grumble and complain. It doesn't take that much. It takes a whole lot more to say, okay, well, in spite of all those things, what can we celebrate? What can we high five? How can we thank people? How can we be a source of courage to others? One of the things that, I've attempted to do in various meetings that we have, and hopefully in a lot of in our meetings we are fixing and sorting out problems, etc. But I've tried to best of my ability when we start a meeting, first few minutes, what can we celebrate? What, what can we high five? And I know there's there are lots of stuff to be fixed and adjust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but you start, what can we high five? What can we celebrate? Sheesh, hadn't thought of that for a while. It's a good question. And then as one person starts to high five, you know, this and this happened last week. And the next person starts to high five. And suddenly all the other stuff starts to grow strangely dim because of what we're celebrating and what we can. And I tell you, that, that idea, that question, that in families, it's so easy for family just to get negative. In friendship circles, for the conversation just to swing negative. Where is our positivity? Where is our faith? I'm not saying we deny the reality, but we lift our eyes. For me, a huge deal of leadership, and there, I know there's people here that lead in all kinds of situations, in all kinds of places, business, home, etc., etc. A whole lot of leadership for me is this, Christian leadership is helping people just lift their gaze, helping people just look up, helping people high five, helping people, including ourselves, to celebrate. Now, there's a, there's a second power that I see in this story. The first one is the power in being with faithful people, and this ties in very much with the second one, it's, is that there's a power in praise. I'm talking about praise here to God. It says here in Acts 16 verse 25, it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, I feel really, really challenged because it doesn't even take a physical beating with rods. 
that often at midnight, if I'm under real stress, I might pop open in the early hours of the morning, I might pop out of sleep and I lie awake for a little bit. My first thoughts are generally not singing hymns to God. The middle of the night, I don't know about you, I'm just being honest about myself, the middle of the night is often when I feel stress, often when I feel a little bit anxious, often when I've taken steps of courage and when we've stepped out of the boat on something, we're plowing ahead on something or the other and then in the middle of the night I wake up and I often think this to myself, what have you done? Why on earth did we say yes to that new thing, acting in courage? I'm not talking about unwise or doing foolish things. That we've stuff we feel God's guided us to do. Like in the middle of the night, I think, oh boy, I think we've made a dreadful mistake. Uh, we, we might have just ruined our family, ruined our future, whatever the case might be. God help. Paul and Silas are seated there in their jail cell, in the inner cell, right in the middle of the prison. And uh, Paul's there with his feet in stocks. Remember I said the jailer had a problem that he did to put them together. And there's Paul lying, his, his feet in stocks, his back sore, beaten. Maybe that night he wasn't particularly feeling that faithful. He's just moaning and groaning a bit, just thinking, I just survived till the morning. And over here on this side of the jail cell, Silas, and he's also a bit sore, and his feet are in the stocks. And he's aching and paining. And he starts to, to just hum. He starts just to sing. My hope is built on nothing less. And over on this side of the cell, Paul's not really feeling in the singing mood right now. Silas, please, man, please, can't you just keep quiet for a moment? I'm just trying to rest. And on this side of the jail cell, Silas is, but Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And on this side, Paul, his foot's locked on the stocks, just starts to tap a little bit. And he starts to hum. And this side, Silas starts to really get into it a bit. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And on this side, Paul can't take it anymore. He just joins in. All other ground is sinking sand. And then they start to sing the second verse, but now they're singing in duet. And Paul can't lie down anymore, nor can Silas, so they just fist bump each other. <laughs> when darkness seems to hide his face, I lean on his unchanging grace. Through every high and stormy gale, my anchor lies within the veil. Now all the prisoners are awake and they're listening because it's not that comfortable in the Philippi jail. And Paul and Silas start to sing together. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And then someone in the cell next door starts to bang his tin cup, he says, give us another one, boys. <laughs> Something incredible happens when these two men start to sing at midnight. It says, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. It would have been exceptionally possible. I can tell you exactly what I would have done if I was seated in jail cell at midnight having been beaten with rods with my buddy. As I'm pretty sure I'd been analyzing the events of the day and say, you know what, Silas? When we get out of here tomorrow, we are going to back off a little bit. We're not going to preach so publicly. Maybe we should just have private meetings. And any slave girls, we don't talk to them. Just leave them be. We're just doing our thing. We're going to pull our names down. We, we're going underground, but they aren't. They are there singing praises to God. And if you like, 
at a human level, they've got in trouble with the authorities and the, the government, the magistrate and the jailer. Everything is against them to keep them stuck. And they could have looked at their situation and looked at their jail cell and looked at their feed and stocks and said, well, this is what it's meant to be. We are stuck. But by singing praise, they essentially go over the heads of the Roman authorities and appeal to, they just fix their eyes on the authority that runs the entire universe. And I don't know, when I read this verse, it's like my imagination just gets the better of me because here they, they're seated in the jail cell and while they're busy singing their next song, their feet stuck. It's almost as if, I'm not saying this is theologically accurate, but the Father in heaven starts to tap his foot. But when God taps his foot, the foundations of the entire jail are shaken and a, mir a miracle happens. Everybody in the whole jail cell's chains come loose. That doesn't usually happen in an earthquake. And Paul and Silas's feet come out of the stocks miraculously and every single convict in that jail are suddenly chain free. And here's the big deal about praise for me, is that our praise doesn't just impact our lives, it's got the impact of those listening, if you like, those around us. The earthquake didn't just benefit the people that were stuck in the inner cell, it benefited everybody in that jail. Everybody's chains came loose. I wonder what would have happened that night if Paul and Silas had have gone the other way around. They'd gone all negative, drawn back into themselves. Said, well, you know what? God's abandoned us to this wretched jail cell. Are we going to abandon God? Ah, I agree with you, Silas. That's just bad news. And they start humming other songs, other tunes, other, another tune on the inside. I doubt that this earthquake would have happened as it did. So often in the Bible, we see this idea of power in praise. I mean, when, when Jesus was asked, how should we pray? This was how he taught his followers. He said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Isn't that praise? Isn't that turning our eyes towards him? And no matter how bad the circumstances, how stuck, how stripped, how beaten I feel here, praise, this kind of prayer turns my eyes heaven where it said, our Father which art in heaven. As I heard somebody once say, he says, the problem with me is that I art on earth. Everything I see is here at a horizontal level, but there's a God in heaven that sees everything from a vertical level, sees it with, he's got full control, full rule and full reign. I say, well, my father, if I was you, I'd do things different. Well, maybe that's why you're not me, son, because I see things as I do. But our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thank you that you care for me and that you love me and that you've got me. Thank you that the end is always good, even if the middle bit has got some pain. And there's another story in Chronicles, the people of Israel got news that a massive army made up of three different nations was coming to them across the desert. And they were petrified, they knew they didn't have the manpower to take down these guys. So they gave everybody in a prayer meeting. Incidentally, we are praying on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. For me, a prayer meeting is like the engine room in a church. We'll be upstairs, there'll be food served afterwards, come and join us, please. And these guys get in a prayer meeting and one man stands up and brings the people a message from God. He says, God says, I will fight for you. I will fight for you. And, and so Jehoshaphat the king gets his army together and he follows the instructions that's given. And then it says this in the book of two Chronicles. It says, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him. There's the word again for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Now, this is an odd military tactic. Let's get at the choir. Let's get the chaps with the best voices, the hymn books, put them in front of the army. Bows and arrows, okay, you guys a little further back. Um, cavalry, a little bit behind those guys. We're sending the, the singers out first. And these guys marching into battle, praising God for the splendor of his holiness, singing. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And the guys behind thinking, well, this doesn't really make sense because we wouldn't go, be going into battle if God loved us. Well, that's not true. It says, as they began to sing 
and praise. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. Really came through a word that was shared a little bit earlier. Who were invading Judah and they were defeated. And the rest of the story says that without even fighting, those three armies started beating up each other. And when the, when the choir and the rest of the army arrived and looked over the hill, all of those soldiers had killed themselves. And they won a massive victory without even firing a single shot. Because there's incredible power in looking heavenward and this idea of praise. I read these kinds of verses and I, I seriously believe we should be a singing kind of people. Doesn't matter if our voices aren't in tune, can't hold a note. The Bible has got a catch-all phrase that says this, make a joyful noise to God. It's so easy to go and download some really great praise music. Other people who have got the voices and the instruments singing to God, getting the words in my head and allowing them to be in my heart and, and just singing along. There's one group of people when it comes to singing where I'm not quite sure I understand. And those are English South Africans. I see, there's a few of us here. So let me step on our toes. The Afrikaners sing. No problem. I go to another church down in Durban, a Zulu-speaking church. That's, this isn't even their choir, just their leaders meeting. And one lady starts singing. Everybody just thrills with song. You go to England and at their football stadiums, everybody sings. But here in South Africa, I don't know what it is about us that we feel all, as we about English South Africans, that we get all quiet and shy. When you see what happens when we sing, Paul and Silas singing in the jail cell in the middle of the night, told the story here once or twice before, but my dad was a man who, my dad and mom were people who believed in singing and praise. And so they'd often just sing, and my dad, he always made us laugh because he forgot the words, and so he would just hum, and then he'd sing the wrong words, and my mom would beetle through and say to him, no, it's not those words, and he says, well, I'm fine, I'm just humming to God, and it was like their thing. But my mom got very sick and she ended up in ICU and she was on her deathbed. For one month, her life hung in the balance between life and death. And we got a couple of phone calls saying, come, we think she's going. And she didn't. And then on a particular morning, I think it was a Thursday morning, 5 a.m., get this phone call, she's on her way out. Probably within the next hour. And we all rush up there. Just watching those monitors that we'd come to hate so much. We see the life ebbing away from her. And in her last few minutes of life, my dad says, let's sing. And we've got quite a big family, so if we all join hands, we could make it right the way around the bed because I'm one of five siblings. Jax was there as well. And we started singing. The song that he leads us in is a song that goes like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then just singing quietly in this ICU ward, some of the nurses come and join in just standing there. He starts to lead us, it is well, it is well. And I can hardly sing because I think, how can you sing it as well when your wife is busy dying? But he knows that it's still well even in the darkest times because God is in control. And he now, a number of years later, has gone to join my mom and they would know better than any of us left here on earth that it is well. And that's what praise does. It reminds us that there's a bigger being, God himself running the world, and that no matter how bad the jail cells on this earth get, eternal life awaits. The third thing in which there is power, and incidentally, I've asked the music team if we can sing again at the end of this meeting, because it's not just me up here singing alone, is there's tremendous power and purpose. Because what's quite incredible 
is what I've read so far, but possibly even more incredible is the next bit of the story that I haven't read. After this earthquake, the jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. Can you imagine living in that much terror? That you've been given this command, you guard those guys carefully. <coughs> he sees this whole jail has been destroyed. He is about to commit suicide on his own sword because he thinks all these prisoners, including Paul and Silas, have escaped. And death by his own sword was a better fate than punishment by the Romans. But Paul shouted. Let me just pause there. That implies that Paul is still there on the site of the jail. Can I ask you a question that might demand a little bit of honesty here? If you had been flogged for something you didn't, that wasn't really anything you did wrong, you're doing something good and you get beaten by rods, whipped, stripped naked, and your feet are in stocks in the inner cell, and while you're singing praises, God supernaturally breaks down the whole prison and everybody's chains come loose, how many of us would still be there 10 minutes later? My hand isn't up, I'm just asking you. I would have taken that as this is my miracle. We're free, Silas, let's run. But Paul had a greater purpose in being in Philippi. And what was that? Was the reason he went after the dream? Is to tell people about Christ. So it says, but Paul shouted to the jailer, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, bearing in mind it's not electricity, there's a candle, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Just earlier that day, Paul and Silas had trembled in pain before the jailer. And now at midnight, the jailer is trembling in front of Paul and Silas. And this is his question. He then brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. This jailer is so moved. He goes and wakes everybody in his household up, says, come chaps. Paul and Silas, they talk to them. At that hour of night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized there in the middle of the night, not waiting, in the water. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. What was the thing that kept Paul and Silas standing in the jail cell after their stocks had broken loose? It was a sense of purpose as far as I understand the story. They had come to Philippi to share the good news of Christ. And even though they were in chains, they were free. And the jailer, even though he was on the outside free, on the inside he was, if you like, in spiritual chains. And by the end of the evening, Paul and Silas have shared not only external freedom with him, but internal freedom with him. Him and his entire household. Now here's the deal. Many commentators believe that this jailer and his household were one of the founding families of the church in Philippi. And next week, we're going to start a series on Philippians, which was a letter written back to that church. And I wonder when Paul was penning those letters, uh, those uh, words, whether he didn't think back with kind of an aching fondness to that night when he got so badly beaten and he was in that jail cell and that jailer was about to kill himself and then his entire household put their faith in Christ. And what happens is that Paul and Silas allowed their purpose to give them their perspective rather than their pain. When we allow our pain to determine our perspective, we end up avoiding situations like this. But when our purpose influences our perspective, we say, now what is the greater reason that I'm in this jail cell? What is the greater reason, if you like, for my pain is to impact other people's lives with the gospel of Christ. And the jailer's life is changed that night. It says he is filled with joy. So Paul and Silas's pain ends up being a conduit for somebody else's joy. In Hebrews 12, verse 2 and 3, you read this. It's, it's about Jesus. It says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. 
You see, what Paul and Silas did was simply copying their master because Jesus Christ was stripped naked and he was beaten. And this verse says that Christ did all of that because of the joy set before him and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, Hebrews says, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is right after he said, keep meeting together so you can encourage one another. He says, consider Christ who didn't allow pain to influence his perspective, he allowed his purpose to influence his perspective. Who because of the joy, the purpose set before him, endured the cross, went through the pain, and sat down at the right hand of God. Didn't take any side exits, didn't bail out. Consider Jesus Christ so that you will not grow weary. Does that sound like you and I? Yes. And lose heart? Yes. What's the solution for that? Is power and purpose, considering Jesus Christ. This incredible story has got a further aspect to it. Imagine if Paul and Silas had have bailed out somewhere along that pain. They're in the middle of the jail cell, feet locked in stocks. They were, they were to resign from their purpose. Silas, we're done. We had a good life before we came here following Christ. And now we've had bad things happen to us. We're bailing out. Do you know that Paul wrote more books in the New Testament than any other person? If Paul had have bailed out at that moment of pain, we would not have those letters in the New Testament to read. I don't know what else God would have done to give it to us. But Paul's perseverance, Paul's perspective and purpose had an impact, have an impact 2,000 years later. We hear talking about Paul, talking about his perseverance, talking about his sense of purpose, talking about him praising at midnight. Who knows what you and I in our current jail cells Whatever the stocks might feel to you, whatever the beatings and the strippings are in your situation right now, who knows what impact that will have if we don't bail out. If we put our eyes on Christ, we get our perspective from His purpose for our lives rather than from our pain in our lives. The next day, Paul gets released and sent on his way. But this night of beating and praise in Philippi leaves us with these three lessons that there is exceptional power in being around faithful people. There's power in praise and there's power in purpose. And thank God that Jesus didn't bail out when it got too painful. And that for the joy set before him endured the cross because you and I would not be here today if his perspective was from his pain. He sees the joy and he says, I'm going through this with a good heart. That's where, most of it, that's where a lot of us fall down. We end up with bitterness, cynicism, pain, etc., etc. He says, for the joy set before him.